All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. If you were asked to describe the values of our Lord, Jesus Christ, how would you respond? Hello, my name is Cliff Goodwin and I welcome you to Preaching the Gospel. Jesus Christ lived a singular life. That is, He lived a life unlike any other that has ever been lived. We know this truly because He never sinned. He never transgressed the law of His heavenly Father. Hebrews 4 and verse 15. And so from a man who lived that kind of life, a man who was that kind of person, how would we begin to describe His values? How would we begin to describe that which meant the most to Him? Well, I think there's a statement that Jesus made Himself during His ministry that would greatly aid us in appreciating what He appreciated. Look with me in your Bible at home to Matthew 16 and verse 26. In Matthew 16, 26, Jesus asked this question. He said, For what is a man profited if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, this question, actually, these two questions are very telling regarding our Lord's perspective and I believe also regarding His values, regarding what mattered most to Him. We know that Jesus came to do the Father's will. John 5 and verse 30 bears that out for us. But in doing the Father's will, He came seeking the souls of men. Jesus knew and understood that the soul of man is immortal, eternal, priceless. Its value cannot be expressed in any kind of monetary sum or figure. Jesus loves the souls of men. And that's what I want us to consider together here today in our study. Christ's love for souls. Let's open our Bibles over to the book of John and particularly John chapter 4. The vast majority of the verses that we'll be reading together here today will come from this chapter. And if you're familiar with it at all, you will remember that in John 4, Jesus has His encounter, His dialogue or conversation with the Samaritan woman there beside Jacob's well. A rich study this holds for all of us. We can look to John 4 over and over again, continually gleaning lessons, continually gaining insight, not only into the life and attitudes and, yea, the values of our Lord, but also into that which we ought to cultivate and employ in our own lives. We can see that, so much of it at least, in John chapter 4. Jesus took the time to initiate this conversation with this Samaritan woman. He initiates the conversation and then He steers and guides the conversation so as to bring this woman to a point where she herself can realize His identity. She can realize exactly who it is to whom she speaks. And you know, each person, every one of us, you and I included, we must come to a point where we realize the identity, yea, the importance of Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let's look to John chapter 4, therefore, and let's consider Christ's love 
for souls. We're going to see that love in his concern for this Samaritan woman and for her soul. And in so examining this, we're going to notice three primary points, three primary lessons that demonstrate for us his love for souls. Lesson number one, we're going to see that Jesus chose souls over society. Now what do we mean by this? He chose souls over society. Well, we mean that souls were more important to, to Jesus than the acceptance of society. And we can readily relate to this because all of us, we know what it means for people to use phrases such as high society. We know what it means for people to talk about social graces. We as human beings, we, we tend to, to care about what other people think about us. And always that is not necessarily bad. As children of God, we do have to be concerned with what is appropriate. We do have to be concerned with the example that we set and with the influence that we leave upon others as well as the impression that we give others in our lives. And so when we talk about society and when we talk about social graces and when we talk about how the society views us, we understand that that is not always unimportant. That is not always negative or involving something that is bad. But there are legitimate concerns along those lines. However, if there ever comes a time in which being accepted by society contradicts or interferes with our value placed upon souls, the importance that we understand and that we see in the value of a human soul, well then certainly then we must, like Jesus, choose souls over society. We must ever be about the Father's business, in other words, trying to win souls to Christ, regardless of what society thinks about our efforts, regardless of whether or not we become popular or unpopular. We have to love people. And in loving people, you've got to love that soul that will live and exist somewhere forever and ever. Jesus did that. This is part of the beauty of Jesus. He chose souls over society. Look with me to John 4 and let's begin reading at verse 7. John 4 and verse 7, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. She comes to Jacob's well. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Verse 8, For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat or to buy food. None of his disciples were there to draw this water for Jesus, so he makes a request of this woman, Give me to drink. Verse 9, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria. Now, that's where her words likely ended. She asked Jesus, How can you, a Jew, talk to me and make a request of me who am a Samaritan? And then John adds by way of comment at the end of verse 9, For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. There we see what would have been accepted or not accepted in the eyes of Jewish society. Jewish society dictated you don't talk publicly. You don't talk socially with Samaritans. You certainly don't request to drink out of one of their water vessels. You don't do this. Even further we learn from history that typically a Jewish male would not speak with a woman in public, period. And yet Jesus, he, he, he does both of these. He talks to a Samaritan. He talks to a woman. Now why? Why run the risk of becoming at odds with social standards, not being accepted by the good graces of society? Why, Lord? Because this woman has a soul. And because Jesus is going to take this opportunity to talk to this woman about spiritual matters. Notice verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, 
if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. No doubt we can see. We can see what matters most to Jesus. Is it being accepted by society or is it the soul of this individual? Without a doubt, it's the soul of this Samaritan woman. And here he tells her in verse 10, he says, If you knew who I am, if you knew the one to whom you are presently speaking, you too would not be so concerned with social standards. You too would not be so concerned with the graces of society, what's expected or not expected of us. You would know that I could give you living water. You would ask of me and I would give you something that no one else can provide. Namely, ultimately, salvation. Jesus chose souls over society. Move down with me further in this chapter. John 4 down to verse 27 and we can still see this emphasis. We can still see this choice that Jesus made. Verse 27, And upon this came His disciples. They were returning from the city where they had gone previously to buy food. And they marveled that He talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? <laughs> you know, that's amusing to me. You can picture them whispering among themselves, Why is our Lord talking to this woman? Not only is she a woman, but she's a Samaritan woman. Why is our Lord talking to her? And yet even though they're pondering this in their hearts and perhaps secretly whispering such things among themselves, not a one of them has the courage not a one of them is so bold or even brazen as to speak up and ask the Lord, What are you doing? Lord, why are you violating social expectations and why are you talking to this woman? Move down to verse 31. We can see again what Jesus is doing and why. In the meanwhile, His disciples prayed Him saying, Master, eat. In other words, Master, we're back now. No doubt they had brought with them food. Master, eat. Verse 32, But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Jesus is preoccupied. He says, I'm concerned with something else right now rather than just uh, squelching my appetite. Rather than just eating food. Now Jesus is not saying that he's necessarily not hungry. He's just saying that there's something more pressing. There's something more important. Verse 33, Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? In other words, has he already eaten? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Jesus says, I've been talking to this woman about her soul. I've been talking to her about her life. I've been trying to impress upon her the fact that I can give her salvation. My meat is to do the will of my Father. Verse 35. Now Jesus makes the application to the apostles themselves and by extension to us also. Jesus said, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Now Jesus, of course, here in verse 35, was speaking spiritually. He was making an illustration, but He was impressing upon them and still today upon us that we need to open our eyes and look around. The fields of humanity around us are white already to harvest. Jesus loved souls. Jesus was cognizant of the need that every lost soul has, the need for salvation. And here in John chapter 4, when he's encountered by a woman who too needs this salvation, a woman whom he knows will be receptive, a woman whom he knows will listen, and not only that, She's going to go back into the city and she's going to tell others also, Jesus chose souls over society. 
He talked to this woman. He taught this woman. And in turn, he winds up even teaching further his own disciples, his own apostles. Christ's love for souls is clearly seen. He chose souls over society. But now number two. In the second place, in his dealings and in his conversation with this Samaritan woman, we can see his love for souls in that he confronted souls with their sin. You know, this is an aspect of soul winning that is seldom pleasant. It's often something that, that we might not enjoy doing. We may not even like doing it, but it's something that must be done. In our work with lost souls, we, like Jesus, have to work to confront souls with their sin. Better stated, we work to help these souls to see their sins themselves. Notice how Jesus does this so judiciously, so wisely with this Samaritan woman. Notice in John chapter 4, picking up down at verse 15. Now Jesus has spoken to her about living waters. He's spoken to her about never thirsting again. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, verse 16, Go, call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidest thou truly. Let's pause right there. In John 4, 15 through 18, Jesus causes this woman, he confronts this woman with her sin. He causes her to come face to face with her sin. You know, it's interesting in verse 15, the woman asked for this, but in so asking, she didn't realize what she was in for. In verse 15, she says, Lord, give me this water that, that will cause me never to be thirsty again. Give me this water that I'll never have to come back and draw from the well. Obviously, she's thinking in physical terms. No doubt the daily task of water retrieval from the well, not only retrieving that water, but then carrying it, bearing it all the way back home, no doubt this daily task was wearisome. And it was very attractive in the mind of the woman. This man can do something for me that will cause me not to have to do this day in and day out any longer. Lord, give me this water. And so in verse 15, she makes the request but she doesn't fully realize at all what she's asking for. She asks, and in verses 16 and following, Jesus gives it to her. He begins by saying, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. In that very statement, Jesus brings up something that the woman would likely rather have not thought about. And that is namely the fact that she's living with a man to whom she has no right. She's living with a man she has no right to be with. This causes her to be confronted with her sin. You know, many times people feel like Jesus, He, he, he never confronted people with their sins. They, they present Jesus as though He's all grace and all mercy and, and all love and peace. And they present a Jesus who would not cause us in any way to feel uncomfortable. But friends, that's not the presentation of Jesus that we find in Scripture. And I want us to get out of John 4 just long enough to realize that this Samaritan woman is not the only soul that Jesus ever calls to confront their own sinfulness. Hold your place here in John 4 and turn over with me one chapter to John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, we have the account of the impotent man, the man who is unable to walk, who is laid beside the pool at Bethesda. Well, Jesus ultimately heals this man. He tells him, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. But later on, Jesus encounters this man in the temple. He finds this man who is now healed and who is now walking about. 
And I want you to notice what Jesus tells them in John 5 and verse 14. Afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. In other words, you've been blessed. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. You know, it's interesting, back in verse 5, we learned that this man had been impotent. He had been unable to walk for some 38 years. But notice also that nowhere in this context are we told that he was born in this condition. And in fact, the words that Jesus tells him in John 5 and verse 14 seem to indicate that he might have done something, something wicked and evil, and in the doing of it, he, he suffered some kind of consequence. It would appear that way at least. And perhaps in doing something evil and sinful, he was injured and was rendered lame or impotent, unable to walk. That's very plausible at the least. When Jesus said, Thou art made whole. You've been given a new lease on life, so to speak. A second chance, a new start. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. In other words, don't go now and participate in evil behavior in which you might again be injured or even killed. And you know, we can relate to this. We know in our daily lives, we hear of those who participate in drinking or in drug abuse or in, in any number of sinful behaviors and they wind up suffering consequences. Physical, earthly consequences that may be painful, that may be debilitating, that may even cost them their lives. Jesus told this man, go and sin no more. Jesus confronted him with his sin and Jesus did not give him a pass. Now go with me to John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, we're familiar with the woman who was taken in adultery in the very act, the Bible says. And this woman is brought before Jesus with the hopes that she can be used by our Lord's adversaries to ensnare Him in His words. They asked Jesus, Moses said that such an one should be stoned. The law dictates that she be stoned to death. What say you? And of course, as you read the context of John 8, Jesus answered in a masterful fashion. He said, He that is among you without sin, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. Slowly but surely, beginning with the oldest or the eldest, even down to the youngest, the woman's accusers left one by one. Jesus looks up, and I want you to begin reading with me in John 8 and verse 10. And when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. And then notice, Go and sin no more. Some people act as though in this context, Jesus gave this woman a pass. He didn't give her a pass. He's telling her, sin no more. And then he adds, or we read next in verse 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The connection should be clear. In following Jesus, we are not permitted, we are not licensed, to just live in sin, to walk in darkness. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Following me inherently means you're walking in light. You can't walk and persist in darkness. As he told the woman here and as he told the man in John 5, we must go our way and sin no more. Jesus loved souls enough that he confronted souls with their sin. Friends, it's been said, and accurately so, that before a person can be saved by the gospel, he or she must first realize that they are lost. And you know, Jesus understood this fact, and we would do well to understand it and to implement our actions accordingly. But now in the last place, 
I want us to also see that Jesus taught souls of salvation. Loving souls means we've got to teach them the truth. We go back to John 4 and in verse 19, after Jesus mentions to this woman how she was living, the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. She goes on to say, Our fathers, the Samaritans, worshipped in this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. Jesus answered this question for me. Is it true that we can worship in Gerizim, or do we need to worship in Jerusalem? Jesus answers her question. So much, in fact, that in verse 22, Jesus tells her she was wrong. He says, Ye worship, ye know not what? We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Friends, Jesus loved souls enough to teach them about salvation, telling them the truth, even when the truth would mean that they had been wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, the Gospel Broadcasting Network has just brought you Preaching the Gospel with Brother Cliff Goodwin. If you have a question relative to anything that's been taught, or if you would like a CD or a tape of the message, just call the toll-free number on your screen. Be happy to send it to you. And by the way, if you would like to study the Bible privately in your own home, we offer free a set of five studies and we'd be happy to send these to you at no cost at all, and it would be of great advantage. Study your Bible, learn the truth, and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. It will have to do with your eternal destiny. We appreciate, Cliff, the excellent job that he did in the presentation of truth. Take advantage of it. May God bless. We concluded our study today by noting that Jesus taught souls regarding salvation. In these closing remarks, I would love to share with you what one must do in order to be saved. One must first hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, Romans 10 and verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Having heard that gospel, one must believe the good news, Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Then one must repent of sins, Acts 2.38, confess Christ even before men, Romans 10.9 and 10, and then be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 22 and verse 16. Visit with the Church of Christ even this Sunday and learn more about these things.